And just a reminder for those of you who are joining us online, you're watching Precurious Big Ideas Summit, broadcast from Zurich right here in Switzerland. The theme of today is Reach Your Summit, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers who will show us how procurement and supply professionals can supercharge their careers and reach peak performance across a whole range of areas. We've had a fascinating morning already with uh, Precurious founder Tanya Siri talking about how the procurement profession can reach peak performance and really uh, supercharge a profession. We've had uh, Jürgen Nielis uh, who was talking about um, how to stand on your supplier's shoulders to reach that peak by really unlocking uh, supplier innovation. So that, that's not all. This morning we've also um, discussed some of our latest research findings along with interview compilations, On the Couch Insights, Best of Precurious and lots more. So if you've missed anything or want to share some of those insights with your network, um, check out the Precurious e-learning section where we've saved all of these videos in um, short micro-learning clips. So you go, what's the second part of the day all about? Tell us. Uh, the second part of the day is all about supercharging your skill set. So we'll be hearing from a lineup of speakers who will talk about which skills you need to focus on. Uh, we've got, um, we're covering topics like closing the, the pay gap, in the, the gender pay gap in procurement, um, also unlocking the power of diversity, which is very important, and one of my favourite ones, which is jargon busting or using language to get ahead in your procurement career. And the subject matter experts joining us today to talk about these topics are Joelle Payon, who is the strategic sourcing and vendor management lead at JCI, who will be talking about diversity, followed by Nick Dobney, former head of procurement at Puma Energy, who will cover communication skills and jargon busting, and John Everett, EMEAI purchasing director at Dow Chemicals, who's one of the strongest advocates in the region for eliminating the gender pay gap. As with the first part of the day, um, we've got plenty of other content apart from the speaker presentations. We've got uh, research findings, we've got speaker interviews, we've got compilations of, of insights. And I'm very excited to say that later in the day, we'll be launching part four of Procurious and Michael Page UK's Procurement 2030 report here on Procurious. And a big shout out to our digital delegates who are following the action at home on Procurious. Don't forget to get involved in the Zurich Big Ideas Summit by sharing your insights, by making comments or by asking questions. And of course, you'll be in the running to win a fantastic Parrot Bebop 2 quadricopter drone. Fantastic. And there's also a whole bunch of other prizes, including Patagonia t-shirts and a Falraven backpack. Help us to spread the word on Twitter and LinkedIn by using the hashtag, hashtag Big Ideas 2018. Let's now cross back to the main stage for our third presenter of the day, Joelle Payon. So um, when we talk about diversity, we think about what? Gender, age, ethnicity, disability, sexual, uh, sexual orientation. Those are the uh, main focus today. But more and more, people are talking about personalities personality and other aspects that are not obvious or visible at first sight. I really like the personality part <laughs> because, um, for example, if you are an introvert or an extrovert, this today is considered as being part of diversity because you don't deal with these personalities the same way you deal with somebody else, let's put it that way. There is another um, part in personality which I really like is the, the people which are, uh, are called like high emotionally intelligence, with, with who has a high emotional intelligence. So compared with the IQ, we are talking here mm. about emotion, so EQ. And these people have a really different approach, for example, to solve issues. They have both, um, they can say the big picture at the same time and focus on all details. So if you are a manager and you have such a personality in your team, it can be very disturbing if you are not prepared or if you, or if you don't know what it is about. Well, I know what I'm talking about. I can answer any question afterwards. So why are we talking so much about diversity? First, we have the moral aspect. There is a kind of big pressure uh, for organizations to hire people that are different. Okay, so this is the moral aspect. But behind, there is a the business part or the financial aspect. Because what does that mean, hiring a diversified or having a diversified workforce? It's not only for the sake of it or to please the government or to please you know, whoever or to, yeah, or to please yourself. No, 
behind diversity, you also have extra benefits for your company. The first point, if you are a company who is selling, which is selling product services, uh, another example, if you sell, if you sell product services for women, it is important that the women you are addressing on the market, so your consumer base, can also relate to your workforce. It would be easier for you just to sell your products. So that's the easiest part. But then there are also other additional benefits, financial benefits of having a diversified workforce. I want to mention these two um, studies I found recently, and especially the second one. A UK report revealed that the British economy could be boosted by as much as 24 billion pounds if black and minorities talent were fully utilized. Meaning that when you have a diversified workforce, you have a <coughs> broad, vast, I would say, um, talent people and able to provide you with different way of working, of dealing with your issues, of prov providing much more innovation than if you were only relying on, sorry for you, white men above 50. <laughs> I'm sorry again, I have nothing against <laughs> you here. But you know, when we talk about diversity, we need to have a comparison, you know, a start to, co to compare with. So, yeah. And um, so this is really important, not only for the moral aspect of it, but for the business. We are all procurement, meaning that we deal with money. Our main objective is to save money for the company, to generate extra profitability for our company. So this is something that is important if the moral aspect is not enough. But when we talk about diversity, Diversity today has become, a, I would say, a trendy word. Everybody's talking about diversity, diversity. A lot of corporations are communicating, advertising about diversity. I embrace diversity. Diversity is part of my values, blah, blah, blah. But what does that mean? What do you do with diversity at the end of the day? And how do you make sure that you will uh, have the expected benefits from diversity? To me, and now people are more and more conscious about that, what is really at stake is not diversity. It is inclusion, because how do you make sure that your diversified workforce will really generate the expected benefits, that you will get increased profitability thanks to your talent, no matter if this talent is a woman, is, is, a, is a black person, or is a disabled person, how do you make sure that you will generate these, uh, uh, these uh, um, extra benefits? So here we are going to talk about inclusion because inclusion is really, really the target. If you allow me, I would like to make a small analogy with the IT world, because as I told you in my introduction, uh, most of my experience was in IT as a procurement specialist. And in IT, sometimes, or most of the time now, in order to fulfill the requirements of the company, we need to rely not only on one vendor, but on a bench, on, on a mix of vendors, in order to build a global solution. I don't want to enter technical words here because I've seen on, on Procurious that uh, you have like 2,000 people coming from the IT world. But again, I want everybody to understand my presentation here is that sometimes you need to rely on different vendors. We all deal with a diversified mm -hmm. panel of vendors. So in IT, when you when you define a solution or when you build a new solution, sometimes you need to bring different vendors all together, a software provider, an integrator, a uh, development uh, service uh, company, et cetera, et cetera. But then how do you make sure that all these vendors will come and build these marvelous solutions that is going to fulfill the requirements of your internal customer? There is an integration part. So in IT, we used to talk about end-to-end integrated solution that is in fully integrated, et cetera, so that our <laughs> stakeholders are not lost. Anyway, they don't care about the technical aspect of the thing. They just want a solution which is working. But in IT, what we are doing is that we make sure that all those vendors will work together and we, bring the, we, we can get the best out of each vendor. So integration is really the glue that will make the solution work. But when it comes to people, we cannot talk about integration anymore. 
You cannot integrate a human being because people come with their uniqueness, with their character, with their, uh, I would say, personality. So here we need to talk about inclusion. So how do we make sure that all this diversified uh, talent-based workforce will be able to give their best to the company? How do we do that? There are different aspects, and we can all support this. First of all, I would say the main responsibility is on the corporation side. We need to make sure that people, no matter, again, their specific characteristic, will be able to be themselves. Okay, we know that in the corporate world, we all have to fit in. <laughs> we need to be integrated, let's, even though I don't like this word, into the company. We have to fit in. But fitting in doesn't mean that you forget who you are. If you're a woman, you're not going to start acting as a male. Just why? To please other people? No. Uh, if you are a disabled person, there's no way you can walk on your feet <laughs> like somebody who doesn't have any disability. So the uh, corporations must foster um, um, a an inclusive culture which will enable people to be themselves so that they can bring really the best to the company. And in this regard, equity for me is key. This is a strong value. It's not only a buzzword from my standpoint. Because what makes the difference between um, diversity, inclusion, before I talk about the integration part, for the IT world and the glue to make sure that all vendors would work together. How do you turn diversity into inclusion? It's only by giving equal chances to all the uh, employee base to reveal themselves and to be who they are, but also <laughs> to be treated equally, meaning giving them the same chances to be promoted, for example. And I don't, I'm not going to talk about uh, salary equity between men and female because I know this is going to be uh, presented by someone else. But for me, the key word here would be the equity part. So allowing people to be authentic. Inclusion cannot work without taking into consideration intersectionality. Intersectionality is something that is quite known in the US part or even in the UK. But in Europe, this is something that is quite new, or people are not really aware of what is it. I don't know if you're here in, in, in the room, you know, you heard about this intersectionality. No, intersectionality basically is, I will take an example. You, you hire a black man in a wheelchair who is also gay. This person will suffer from different type of discrimination at the same time. So if you want to address diversity issues with a person like this, what are you going to do? Are you going to fix the issue with the wheelchair? Or are you going to consider first his sexual orientation? So what I mean here is that you cannot have an inclusive um, environment or if you don't address all the different aspects of diversity. This is really key because if you don't, you can fix one of the issue. You can you can help the person to be uh, to, to 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 you know just you, you can fix one of the aspect of this of this uh, diversity. But if you let the two others, the issue will still remain. And usually, when we talk about diversity or inclusion, corporations they used to focus only on one thing. For example, the, the for example, the women, so we say, okay, there is an issue with gender equity and salary base. But then what do you do with the black female? The issue will be a bit different or there will be duplicated issue. So we just need to be very careful of, about that. I'm conscious of the time, so I will jump into the conscious and, uncon and unconscious bias. When you address diversity issues or inclusion issues now, you need to assess all those bias. And the role of HR is really key in this regard because HR is the one responsible for the human resources into the, uh, in, into the company. But HR are also just human beings. So how do we make sure that HR don't have 
the same unconscious bias and we really develop and foster this inclusive environment. We can rely on technology for this part, not only to hire people, but to make sure that all the talent of the company, no matter their specific aspect or characteristic, will have the same chances to grow in the company. And as an individual, how can we all contribute? I would say the first thing, we all hear about know your suppliers, because <laughs> we are from the procurement world. But what about know your company? So raise question, ask question. Is there any strategy in regards to diversity and inclusion in your company? What are they doing? How do they address issues? Is there a very transparent approach in regards to diversity and inclusion? The second point is know your worth, especially if you are directly concerned by diversity. Uh, when I say know your worth, I mean you need to identify your unique setting point. Because it's not because you've been, you, you may have been hired because you are a woman, but first don't forget that if you've been hired, it's because you are a talent for the company, so you deserve it. You, you organization doesn't hire just because of the sake of it. Remember what I, what I was mentioning initially. So they hire diversified workforce, but based on competencies first. So once you join the company, don't forget about your, comp your competencies and cultivate your unique selling point. Your unique selling point has nothing to do with the fact that you're a woman or you're a black person. It's about the real, what makes you unique as an employee. And by doing so, you can cultivate this and you can leverage on this to continue growing in your company. Doing so, be careful of the underdog. I don't know if you're familiar with underdog, what, is, what it means. So when you are kind of minority in a group, you tend to work twice, four times harder than your other co-workers. But doing so, you may be perceived as a threat from your, I would say, uh, <laughs> colleagues. And then the one who used to welcome you in the team may become your best enemy just because you are doing too much. So be careful about that. You need to find the right balance. Even though you, need, you want to, show, to, to prove that you deserve your seat at the table, be careful in the way you demonstrate and the way you, you show up or you shine in the company. I really like what you said, Tanya, about the fact that if you're a woman or anybody, you have to show, you have to, to show that you want to move ahead that you want to get this promotion, but be careful, there are other people around you who are just waiting for the same thing. And the last one, be an influencer. We all have um, an account on the, uh, on the social media, especially on LinkedIn. So we all know what an influencer is, and most of us, or some of us would like to become an influencer to have like thousands of, of, of followers. But you can also be an influencer in your company by supporting and pushing forward this idea of, of diversity and also inclusion. My last slide here. I want to finish with this quote, this famous quote from Victor Hugo. Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Today, while I was preparing this, uh, this speech for, for Procurious, I tried to remember all the hot topics, keywords that I've heard for the past 12 months. And my conclusion is that there is a kind of revival, first, of ethics and of great values like ethics and integrity in the business. People are really looking forward to see their values reflected into the companies either they are working for or from which they are buying stuff. So it is really important for a company to show, to mirror, I would say, to, sh to show to their customers that they are completely aligned. A second point is mental health. We talk, we, we hear a lot about uh, bore out, now for burnout, bore out, brownout, whatever. We've heard about lots of suicides related to the work. So people are really concerned about that. People are looking for companies which can provide them with this safe environment where they can be just themselves. And the last one and the most iconic one is this Me Too. Me Too started with the Hollywood, with Hollywood, and uh, I would say nobody really anticipated this kind of big wave. And now Me Too is entering the corporate world. But I'm wondering how many companies really anticipated what is coming up. Very few, because when I read the news and what is happening with some big corporation, I mean, it's not give any name here, but we all know <laughs> who I'm talking about. Um, it's good to provide corrective 
actions afterwards. It costs a lot to the company. But what if we anticipate, instead of waiting for a case to be reported and then to pay, to give a big check to the victim, what if we anticipate and we prevent these issue to these issues related to diversity inclusion to arise? So my last point here is, we all want to be leaders in our core business, core competencies. But how many of us and how many companies will really take the lead of inclusion to make sure that any individual can feel safe, welcome to share its, his or her views, no matter the religion, no matter the sexual orientation, just as a human being. Because here we are not talking about making an impact only in the company to make sure that it will generate much more benefits, but we are talking about the society. So corporations can really make a difference by fostering this inclusive environment and doing so influence the way the company is evolving. And in any case, the change is coming. But in Europe, again, things are coming, but slowlier. But it is something that is going to come and stay. So here the message is really, instead of waiting for it, anticipate it, embrace it, and be part of the people who will influence to have this better society. And we as procurement people, and I really like what you mentioned about the, uh, the fact that it is complicated to show the benefits. No, it's not. There are thousands of studies on the internet showing how a more inclusive, I don't I don't want to talk about diversity anymore, but a more inclusive workforce can increase really profitability. The figures are there, there is a business case. So if people don't push for more diversity just because of the moral part, they can do it because of the business case, it works. And we should not forget that the ultimate goal of an organization is what? Sustainability, meaning survive. How do we make sure that we are going to be there in 2030? We need to have customers. What if my customers does not recognize themselves in my values, in what I'm doing, in my, work, in, in my uh, workforce? I may lose customers, I may lose consumers. So maybe in 20 years, I won't be there anymore. So survival means adapting. Adapting means embracing change. So there is no way people can <laughs> avoid this, or organizations can avoid this. That's why we all need to be part of this movement and encourage this. I really can't stress enough how important this topic is. There's nothing fluffy anymore about diversity and inclusion. It's becoming um, recognized increasingly as an absolutely uh, key source of competitive advantage in, in companies across the world. And the heads of diversity and inclusion are now really major players in all these big organizations. For me, having a diverse team is a key factor that unlocks innovative thinking. People tend to draw upon their breadth of experience and diverse backgrounds to find those aha moments or the big ideas that will really make a difference. So I always like to quote Tom Derry, who's the CEO of the Institute for Supply Management um, and a frequent uh, guest on the Precurious blog. Um, and he is another passionate advocate for diversity. So he's said in the past that a procurement or supply team um, that doesn't have um, diversity will actually look very impoverished in this day and age. Um, they'll really miss out on those um, eureka moments when people from different backgrounds um, come together, collaborate, and that's when the magic happens. In fact, ISM um, have built an entire conference around the theme of diversity, so um, do be sure to keep an eye out for that in uh, mid-2019. Hi, I'm Nora, content writer at Precurious. Let's take a look at some of our most popular blogs on the power of diversity. In five reasons supplier diversity matters, we outline why supplier diversity is important for any procurement team. Six reasons it pays to care in procurement reveals how doing good in your procurement career can be pretty lucrative. Not 100% your type, look again, explores our unconscious bias when hiring new talent and why we need to be more open-minded. Social enterprises require a lot of extra procurement work and hand-holding, so it's totally fine to avoid them, right? Exploding the four social enterprise myths puts all your common assumptions about social enterprises to bed. People with neurodiverse profiles have historically endured stigmatisation and struggled in the workplace. 
John Floyd explains why and how this is changing and what we can do to accommodate and embrace differences in neurodiversity, your secret HR weapon. Straight from the stage, I'm now joined by Joelle Payon. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. What's the one thing that you would like the delegates online and the people here today to take away from your presentation? What I want people to take away from this presentation is that diversity and inclusion is not only for women, for uh, people with the different ethnicity or different uh, sexual orientation, it's for everybody. Diversity and inclusion, which is much more important than diversity, means that we need to provide each human being with equal treatment in the corporate world, but also in the society. So by fostering an inclusive corporate environment for people, we can really make a change and improve the way the society is working. What do you think is the one thing that's holding people back from achieving peak performance in their career? By experience, I would say self-doubt. Because if you don't believe in what you are doing, this is the best way for you to fail. So when you have some peak performance, some peak uh, periods in your day-to-day -day, uh, or in your working uh, environment, you really need to think about the objectives you want to reach and no doubt at all. If you have some questions, do not hesitate to ask for advices to find some sponsorship internally, to, to talk to your mentor. The mentoring part is really, really important mm -hmm. to prevent you from being you know, completely overloaded by self-doubt and refraining from achieving your potential in your organization. So banish the self-doubt. Exactly. Joelle, thank you. Thank you very much. What would you say is the biggest hurdle to your career progression? Um, the three top answers we got from our responders was, number one, uh, flat organization. Um, that's something we always see and something we can't really control all the time. Uh, the second was lack of mentors within the organization. And third was uh, a lack of champion or sponsor. So if you think about it, there's not a lot of difference between sponsors and mentors, but a vital difference is a sponsor is the one who has your back within the organization, who supports you at a higher organizational level. Mm -hmm. A mentor is one that you work very closely with. You tell them about your problems, you seek guidance, you work very closely with to understand how do you get ahead in your career. Why should I hire you? My favorite question would be, what's your passion? What is your passion? Um, it's, you know, if you, it's one thing to just come to work, but if you're really passionate about what you do, you will enjoy your work. It's not just about your job, but also how you do your job. So what's your passion? And I usually ask them, what are you gonna do for me in the next 30 days? Um, I ask that because I'm looking for people that are actually gonna plan out uh, the first 30 days and actually look to achieve something. So looking for doers rather than people that are there to mark time. I love to ask candidates about the last book they read because I'm most interested in curiosity. Are they curious? What are they curious about? It tells me a lot about them. Um, we asked the question, uh, how, why, why, do you, why are you choosing the travel industry to, to work? Uh, is it just about the, the free trips or the perception of the free trips or is there something a little bit more, more um, around this? And mostly what we're looking for are, uh, are res responses from uh, potential employees around their, their wishes to provide services for customers, to have a fulfilling, uh, rewarding career in an industry which has been going for you know, hundreds of years and will continue into, into the future. My favourite question to ask candidates in a job interview is, what do you see the difference between sales and operations planning and integrated business planning? And the reason why I ask this is, is first to understand whether or not they know what sales and operations planning is and what integrated business planning is and the maturity of the business that goes from one to the other. And it also gives me an indication as to whether or not they understand how supply chain is integrated within the larger business organism. Job interviews are one of the most important things we do. And what I do when I do an interview, I start at the bottom of the resume. And I ask about things like hobbies, interests, because really what I want to know is deep down, what motivates people? So the favorite question, or the question I always ask interviews, uh, candidates is, what gets you up from bed every day? And I know it's a, it's, it's a very simple question, but it's a very open-ended question. 
there's, it's, there's no right or wrong, and it's very personal. But what it does tell me, it gives me insight into what motivates um, an individual, what's important to him or her, what do they value, what do they look forward to. Because for me, I'm always big on attitudes and behaviors. The go-to question I have is, what are two or three things you're really, really bad at? And what I'm looking for is, A, what they're really bad at, but more importantly, the degree of introspection that they have. So if they have been honest with themselves and done a real inventory of what their um, areas of development are, which are their weaknesses, then there's somebody I can trust and work with. Um, if I hear somebody say, you know, I don't have any, then they're not going to be a good fit for us. Tell me a situation where you've led something. It could be a group of Boy Scouts, it could be a charity fundraiser, it could be a major initiative in your company. But what I want to look for is some passion and the ability to lead something and see it through. And I also advise people, make sure you're building your trophy cabinet. And what do I mean by trophy cabinet? I mean, have those projects and those things that you've achieved that you can point to when you're in a job interview and say, well, I led this, I delivered this. It's very important to be able to quantify your achievements throughout your career. You know, what, what is most important to you in life? You know, and where do you want to be at 60? Now, that's a question you ask a 22-year-old and they're a bit staggered. I mean, you know, the classic is, where do you want to be in five years or three years? But I think by saying, where do you want to be? You know, when you finish this whole work thing, you know, do you want to be living in a huge house with a collection of the finest cars? Do you want to be on television as an expert? Um, do you want to be writing books? Do you want to be um, just hugely respected in your field? Do you want to be a CEO? Because that affects, when you're 25, that does you need to make those decisions. If you want to have a job where you're going to have a huge house, well, you probably need to be in a career where you're earning a lot of money. You know, and there's no point in doing something where you're not. Well, we've heard from Joelle Payon about the importance of diversity in your talent pool. And continuing on the subject of talent and peak performance, let's talk about skills. You go. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a, a fun fact. We asked all of the winners of the 30 under 30 ISM uh, supply chain stars um, competition last year what they believed was the key factor um, that contributed to their career success. And the, the clear answer that came out in front was, drum roll please, communication. So mm -hmm. communication is absolutely vital. It's not something that procurement and supply chain um, necessarily does well at the moment. Um, but, you know, really good communication in procurement involves um, cutting out the procurement jargon, aligning your language to that used by the wider business, and learning how to use the power of storytelling to really get your message across. And of course, that's the topic of our next speaker, Nick Dobney, who's here to talk about using language to get ahead in procurement. Let's now go back to the main stage. The, the first thing I'm going to share with everyone today is I have a confession. And my confession is that I chose procurement to be my career. I just think it's a really important <laughs> affirmative statement to make because I have, through 25 years of working in procurement, I have come across so many people who say, I fell into this. I didn't know what it was. I don't know where it started from. I chose this career. What that means is I'm very passionate about procurement. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is, is how we can, as a procurement profession, make sure that we're continually focusing on business. Because the fundamental of procurement, and people who say, I don't even know what procurement is, uh, I find that really bizarre, because if you don't know what procurement is, you don't know what business is. Because the fundamental of business is buying things, resources, people, etc., taking them into your organisation, transferring, adding value to them, and selling them to your customers. So for as long as business has existed, procurement has existed. So I, I find it really strange that people have a, a bit of a complexity around what the hell procurement is. So let's talk about language. Um, and I think that my prompt for this presentation was that famous phrase, which is, what would your team say about you that you know, gets under your skin? What is the one thing that gets under your skin? And uh, the one thing that gets under my skin is procurement terms. Procurement terms that my stakeholders won't understand, that my C-suite won't understand, and that quite frankly, in procurement, we spend a lot of time debating amongst ourselves to see if we've got clear thinking as well. All of that time and effort is distracting us away from delivering on behalf of our business. 
Three, three, three there's, there's a whole mix of words uh, I've just put on the slide here. The, the three things that I'll just pull out for now, um, and, and if any of my team, previous teams are watching this, they'll certainly smile when I say the word tender, because they know full well never to come to me and talk about tenders. <laughs> the fundamental reason is because a tender is such a broad in, you know, word that can be open to so much interpretation, it's actually become meaningless. What do you want to do? Are you selecting a supplier? Are you exploring the market? Are you benchmarking your costs? Well, if those are the things you're doing, let's say them. Let's not wrap that up or hide it into this word of tender. The second one that gets, on my, gets, 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 me, gets me excited is the fact in procurement we constantly talk about direct and indirect. So I've been in a procurement career for 25 years, as I've said. I've never worked in a manufacturing company. So in a manufacturing company, it may be fully understandable what direct is and what indirect isn't, and the difference between both. But in service companies, I worked for an airline. Now what's direct, what's indirect? We bought aircraft, we bought fuel, we bought engineering services, we bought food and drink to go onto the aeroplane, we bought ticketing systems, we bought call center op operations. What's direct, what's indirect? In my world, and when I work as a, as a procurement leader and I talk to Again, back into the C-suite conversation, into the CEO or the CFO. I need to talk about impacting OPEX, operating expenditure. I need to talk about impacting capital expenditure. Or I need to talk about impacting the cost of goods sold. So again, if we want to use indirect, direct, that's fine amongst procurement people. But f for me, let's not waste our energies trying to explain that to other people. And then the last one that I'll come across uh, just for now to illustrate uh, the point is SRM. <laughs> Strategic or supplier, whichever way you want to call it, but supplier relationship management. I don't know who came up with those three little words. It goes back a long time now. I don't know if we in the room, and there's a number of people in the room, could come together with a, with a single definition of what those things are. I certainly know that when I've ever spoken to the chief executive of the companies I've worked for, I've never even used the words SRM. What am I, what, you know, the fundamental of SRM, if we put it into plain English, is what? Getting the best performance I can out of the suppliers that I choose. So let's talk about it as performance. Let's talk about it as a means by which I get the performance that I require in my business from my supply base, from my suppliers. That plain English, it makes us accessible. It makes the procurement function accessible to business leaders. And that's what we want to do. We want to break those doors down. There's lots and lots of talk about how does procurement get a seat at the top table. Well, the first thing we've got to do is make sure these terms we're talking about, we you only use them amongst ourselves. Because the terms we need to use with our business leaders has got to be the terms that they understand. And I have one statement here that I'll kind of that, that enshrines what I expect from people in procurement teams who work for me and how I encourage people to come into the procurement profession and to get excited about what we do. And it's very simply, tell me about the impact you are having on our business. Are you able to describe simply, straightforwardly, the impact you're having? Are you improving our margins? Are you getting a better return on our investments? Are you increasing or reducing the amount of our working capital that we need to fund our business? Are you reducing our net debt? Are you taking assets off of our balance sheet so that we can free up resources to invest in product development? These are all business aspects. There's, you know, particularly you know, those words I've used there are very much the finance aspects. I think there's also the business aspects in terms of future growth. Again, are you freeing up resources to enable us to invest in growth? I've got a great example uh, in a retail world, a French retailer. Uh, they wanted to open on bank holidays and on Sundays. Now, in France, there's all sorts of restrictions about opening on Sundays, but some Sundays you can open. The challenge they had, they'd never done it before. They're very much a retailer that's focused on business-to-business -business or business-to-small small business transactions. They didn't know it would work. They needed to get the money from somewhere to invest in this. Where did they get the money? They came to, to, to my function, and they said, look, all the savings you're making, Nick, fantastic, because what we're able to do with all those savings is open on bank holidays and open on Sundays with interim staff. And we can afford that. Our business plan at the start of the year said we couldn't afford it. The work your team has done has enabled that. I can directly link the impact of good procurement 
to business growth. That, for me, has got to be very powerful, and that, for me, has got to be where we want to be in procurement. Certainly, leaders, but actually the whole function needs to be in that, in that frame of mind. So, procurement in plain language. Um, and I think there's a bit of... You know, I, I just want to tap into something here, which is, um, uh, wh why do we make things... Why do we create new terms for things? Why do we create uh, a language that's very specific to us? I think it's to prove to ourselves that we're doing something that's really quite clever. I think it's to prove to ourselves that we're doing something that is intellectually stimulating, that merits our education and merits our experience. I would go even further and challenge that and to say the fact that you know what you're doing, the fact that you've got lots and lots of experience dealing with a very diverse range of suppliers, a very diverse round of, range of stakeholders, the fact that you can put it into straightforward language demonstrates your capability, it demonstrates your intellect, it demonstrates that you know your subject matter fully. So I've just got a few words up here, I'll just kind of have a look at them um, uh, with you here. What's procurement about? Spending money wisely. Seems pretty straightforward. What, what's my role? Well, my role is to find the best suppliers for my organisation. Okay, so the first question I've got, I'm working in, let's say I'm working in logistics, and uh, I'm looking at my logistics current supplier, and I'm looking at the market. Well, how well do I know the market? How do I know my current supplier is the best supplier I've got? I've got a lot, got a lot of work to do. Uh, what am I doing? Well, I'm obtaining the goods and services required for today and for the future. And I think certainly when we consider the future and we consider the challenges that procurement has got, securing the resources that we need or our organisations need, I think is going to be getting stronger and stronger as the number one reason why you employ procurement professionals. It's to secure those resources. When you look at population growth, you look at the way that uh, population densities are going to change in terms of geographies, when you look at scarcity of resources in terms of water, the fundamental thing procurement have got to bring to an organisation is securing those resources. And I think that's going to be fundamental for me for the next 20 or 30 years. When we talk about tendering, RFPs, RFQs, RFIs, what are we really doing? We're evaluating suppliers, we're negotiating with them, we're selecting them. Again, straightforward language, easily accessible. It puts you in a great place when you talk to the leader of, you know, the director of marketing, the director of logistics, etc. What I've been fortunate enough in my career to do uh, is, is to come into contact with pretty much every part of an organisation and to work directly with the leaders of each function of the organisation. The only way I can do that successfully is by adapting what I say to the language that they understand. You go to a marketing director and you say, I want to get savings. Not interested. You go to the marketing director and say, I can help you get more value for the money you're spending. You get a different conversation. And then let's think about this SRM piece. Um, what's it about? I mean, it's about keeping suppliers motivated. Who, is, who, who in the organisation knows how to motivate those suppliers? Surely it's us in procurement. And largely speaking for me, motivation of suppliers comes down to, again, we can refer back to the, to the theory, no problem at all, it comes back to Michael Porter and Michael Porter's uh, basis uh, principles of what makes, uh, what, what, why do companies exist? For volume, for differentiation? Well, let's understand that and let's understand that in our supply base. Because if we understand that, we can understand how to motivate them. We've got to focus on the resources that really matter. Again, it's a challenge for us in procurement to make sure that we don't get distracted. We've got to stay focused. This is what the business expects of us, securing those resources that makes the business tick. We, don't, we can't afford to get lost in lots and lots of detail. And the last one I'll just kind of um, highlight on here is is, is the idea of procurement as an enabler of setting my company apart from its competitors. What do I mean by that? I mean we can secure resources, we can secure supply chain that enables our business to be very different from all of our competitors. That could be because we can go into a new market and we can secure not just the customer base, we can secure the supply chain for that new market. Again, procurement, we know how to do that. And are we doing it? I don't know. I think that's our opportunity. So, in, in, in pretty much in summary, some, some tips and takeaways here. 
um, let's be really, really simple about things. Procurement's about doing business. So let's talk business. Think of your friends and family. Think of other people. If you can't describe to them what you do, and they're your friends, how can you describe that to people in marketing or into logistics or into operations? Or into you know, all these people from diverse backgrounds, from diverse functions? Absolutely, my expectation would be that professionals are going to invest time and effort to develop these skills. You can be the world's best negotiator, you can be the world's best analyst, evaluator of situations. If you can't make that bridge to your stakeholders and engage with them, bring them on the journey with you, then you're lost. So my challenge would be to say, how much time are you spending investing in your own skills of engaging with your stakeholders? And I think I've said this many times, but let's use this very straightforward language. Let's try and avoid getting lost in these debates. I mean, I've, I've seen debates about, is it called buying? Is it called procurement? Is it called purchasing? Does anyone care? It's about securing the resources I need to operate my business with. Okay? These are just labels. Anyway, I'll finish on that note. Thank you. All right, let's put a very concerning graphic up on the screen. We asked 590 procurement professionals to rate their manager's effectiveness in communicating the need for change, and the results show that procurement leaders are regarded as only 51% effective in this area. In other words, half the time, they're simply unable to get the message across. So given that change management is an integral part of many senior roles in the profession, this perception must be improved. The thing is, we should be better at communication and change management because procurement leaders spend much of their careers listening, listening to pitches from the best salespeople that vendors have to offer. And as a result, we're familiar with every trick in the book. It's essential to put this knowledge to use when selling the need for digital transformation in procurement to the wider, wider business or motivating the function to embrace this need for change. A lot of the presentations today have been about artificial intelligence and automation in procurement. Tell me about videos on this particular subject that people can access on Procurious. Uh, well, there's a webinar, Beat the Bots webinar, that we did with IBM. Um, it's predicted that by 2020, every important decision is going to be, whether it's personal or professional, is going to be um, made with the assistance of AI, artificial intelligence in Beat the Bots, how humans will win the day, we take the optimistic and realistic approach that that's not going to be the case. So we discuss the advancement of cognitive technology and how it can be the enabler, not the disabler of your career. I'm now joined by Nick Dobney. Nick, great presentation. Thank what you. kind of reaction have you had? Uh, I think it was very positive in the room, actually. Mm -hmm. I think amongst the other procurement leaders, a lot of nodding of heads, a lot of recognition that the language that we use is fundamental to how we can move away from being maybe seen as a very technical function into being a function that really does contribute to the business. Tell me what the number one factor in holding people back from achieving peak performance in their career. What's that? I think I, it's between confidence and ambition. So I think, I think people are genuinely ambitious. And I've, I've Lots of people working in teams for me who are, I can see the ambition, but their confidence when they're in the room with stakeholders becomes, it becomes a block because they're becoming subservient to the people that they're in the room with. So instead of seeing their stakeholders as fellow co-workers, we all work for the same company, we're all trying to achieve the same things, they adopt this customer servant type mentality and I think that holds them back. So what's the answer to that? So the answer to that is, is you've got to know your business. You need to absolutely be clear on what your contribution is, what your impact is going to be on the business and the objectives of the business. So that when you sit in the room with your stakeholders, you can talk from a point of confidence because you know the skills that you bring are skills that the business doesn't have. They're unique and that you're going to contribute to the business and those business objectives. And therefore, you merit your place at the table, not you've got to beg for it. If you could excel at only one skill or attribute, what would it be? So for me personally, and you can see I'm quite fixated about language, 
it's the ability to grasp a lot of detail, but to distill it down into something quite precise. When I observe fellow leaders um, and, and, and business leaders generally, they don't talk a lot of detail. They tend to talk with a lot of cut through and a lot of precision. And I think for me personally, that's a skill that I've continually got to develop, is the precision in the language I use. Cut to the headlines. Correct. Nick, thank you. Thank you, Tris. Do you need an RFP checklist? Do you need to understand reverse auctions? Do you want to view a template for category management strategy document? Don't fear, help us at hand. These documents and many more can be found in our procurement toolkit group. We actively encourage our community to share their own templates and documents that have helped them, so please feel free to use them and to also share your own. Check out the groups tab on Procurious today and see which one is best to help you. Um, I would have liked to know that I would, how to win the Olympic Games. <laughs> And that has always been a passion, and I've worked very, very hard for it in a team. Uh, and uh, um, of course, we made it to the Olympic Games, but we didn't get the gold medal. So I want to say with that, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty competitive, but I'm really someone who wants to do that together with a team in, uh, in harmony, in great synchrony. That you cannot rush things, and that you need to be patient, and that things come to you rather than you have to chase them. I wish I'd known that there were two kind of values, basics. There was something called financial value, which I kind of overshot that runway. But I wish I'd known there was something called non-financial value, which would change my life and is actually how we change all our own lives. And I wish that was something that was taught. That there are really no mistakes you can make. To me, honestly, it, it would just hold you back. Don't have any limiting beliefs about where the, where the boundaries are. Oh, um, two things. First, the numbers to the lotto. <laughs> that made my life easier. And then uh, I would have wished somehow to be ready for all the changes. You know, when I was 20, I had my first computer. I would never have imagined it would have been so ever present there. I, at 20 years old, I was in the last year of college. I wish I'd known that there was things called internships. Uh, they're a fantastic thing. And the more that you can do of them before you enter a career or an organization, potentially more permanently, the better. Internships are wonderful. My advice to my former self there back then would be to experiment, right? Experiment. And uh, I, I think it took me a while actually uh, to, to figure out that actually every role has something unique and different about it. Um, and uh, there was one particular role in my career where I remember going into it and I wasn't that excited about the role and it turned out to be the most fantastic role that I'd ever worked in. Gave me all sorts of exposure and yet if you'd asked me, you know, do I really, did I really want to do that role, the answer would have been no at the time. Um, but I took it and it turned out to be fantastic. So I think it's important to experiment. Don't uh, recognize that you don't always know what a role is until you're in it, and you will find something uh, that is uh, absolutely transformational where you can put your footprint and drive huge amounts of value. And, uh, and that was certainly my case. When I was 20, I wish I knew about the mentoring part because I started my career just by myself, struggling with a lot of issues. And if only I had a good mentor with me, I guess I would be far, far, far away from there. Uh, I wish I'd known that I've got the business acumen that I could have run my own business. I wish I had known the, the value of, of networking. Um, and I don't mean just knowing a bunch of people. That I actually understood how I contribute to a network of people and how me knowing how I contribute to that network, getting something back from that work, work where they help me. I wish I had worked that out as a plan. Now we're going to cross back to the main stage for our fifth presenter of the day, John Everett. Now we've already had Joelle Payon talking about the undeniable benefits of diversity. Now John will have a laser focus on one of the most physical challenges that's stopping the profession from reaching its summit, the gender gap. Let's cross over to the stage now. Thank you very much. Indeed, I do stand on the shoulders as one of the presentation's uh, title is of some very good uh, presenters before me. Uh, they've set up uh, the mosaic, for example, of diversity, which is wonderful to see, and the language that we could 
should and sometimes shouldn't be using as well. So that's uh, a real opportunity for me to invest a little bit more time on one of the elements of the mosaic of diversity, uh, the gender side of things. As I was doing the dry run for this presentation, uh, somebody I showed my first slide to said, well, that's a bit of a, a weird start, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I said, yes, I've done that intentionally. Because my goal is that at some point, we get to a situation where this conversation is a thing of the past. Where that slide from the, I just showed in this context is a topic that's weird because we've gone way past it. So that should be our goal, that should be our aspiration. So let's, let's go through a few things specifically related to the gender uh, story here. And um, a lot of the things that I've brought into the dialogue we're going to have come from the uh, SIP Switzerland side of the equation. Uh, being here in Switzerland with uh, literally hundreds of international and national champions based here gives a lot of opportunity to see a lot of diversity in that context as well. I think, um, I think we're all familiar with this uh, left hand uh, slide here. You know, we're familiar with the fact that data has been presented to us that there is uh, not very many female CPOs, CEOs, or females on boards at executive levels. And the representation is quite frankly not good enough. Um, but we've also seen data time and time again, as was previously mentioned, that the companies that have got past that glass ceiling are performing better than companies that are not, that are still in the non-diverse paradigm. So I think we're all familiar with that. So let's move on. Let's look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the purchasing part of the equation. Let's look at some facts and figures that we've, uh, that we've seen over the last one to two years from some research that SIP Switzerland has done. It contacted over 25 different international purchasing associations that represent a quarter of a million purchasing people. So statistically, I guess this is relatively sound. And what it found out that about 50% or just under, between 40 and 50%, depending on what country you are, uh, what the association is, are female members. So there's a very solid base of female membership. But when it comes to kind of visibility or role models, accessibility, then it starts to deteriorate. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, the number of ladies going to networking events going to best practice events, deteriorates. It, it reduces from the number of women who are in the profession. I certainly hope that managers aren't stopping them going. Uh, I doubt that very much. I'm sure there's other reasons. And then again, when we look at the, the next level of visibility, we talk about presenters. How many presenters are on the podium, are on uh, panel discussions? Are they balanced? How many of you have seen where there's 80% women and only one man on there? Not enough is the answer to that uh, situation. So there's a visibility opportunity, a role model opportunity. And more recently, uh, this is work uh, from Oliver Weinman and the BME in Germany, that they looked at um, specifically uh, the European Union and compared that to Germany. And uh, their insights were that Germany is behind the rest of the European Union. So the lower figure on that range is in both cases Germany. They looked at the number of women in German procurement organizations and European procurement organizations. They reached out to nearly 200 CPOs. So again, it's a pretty sound statistical base. Unfortunately, what they didn't show was how many CPOs were, were, were female. Uh, but I guess that we can draw the conclusion from, uh, from the uh, trend of those two statistics beforehand that it isn't enough. So I think we probably uh, already have a basis for uh, uh, why this is an important topic. There is a gender gap still. Let's look at um, measuring beyond the outcomes. I think the previous slide was outcomes of policies or legacies. Uh, other presenters have talked about unconscious bias. And I think in order to explore that in a little bit more detail, there are a number of different things 
that you could and should already be asking yourselves. Not just the question, how many women do we have in our organization, at what level, but how many of the spot and recognition awards are we giving to women? Are we, for whatever strange and wonderful reason, giving more better performance awards, annual bonuses to men than women? Is there balance there? Are we, for whatever reason, giving special projects, accelerated career opportunities to men more than women? Um, foreign assignment opportunities, who's getting those? Um, and promotional considerations, are we really being fair in those? And if you don't have some facts and figures on all of those basic subjects, you know, which is part of the pot of how your organization is running, then you probably won't know, know how to impact how you could change the outcomes that we so showed on the previous slide. So I think many people have heard of unconscious bias. Um, if you've heard of it but haven't been on a course, then do that. It's the first step. If you've been on a course, then go on it a second time or a third time, because you will learn a lot more. No one learned to play the violin on a 30-minute WebEx course. Right? You've got to practice, get feedback, practice, get feedback. Changing your own habits, your own biases is not going to happen overnight. And best of all, give a UCB course. Much better to be really involved and become a role model in that context. Embrace it, legitimize it in your organization. So there's a few insights of things that we could also be measuring instead of just the male-female percentage there. And other things that I've seen from companies who are really taking this subject seriously are listed on this slide. I'll delve into two of them uh, in a bit more detail, given the time constraints. The first one is about recruiting. Um, I learned a couple of years ago about the importance of ensuring that the language that you use on the job advertisement plays a significant role on how many people and what type of people apply. There's a lot of work in this area. Do Google it. There's even software companies that will analyze your job company, your job advertisements, to say how gender biased they are or not. Let me give you an example. Do you think the expression, the candidate must be an aggressive negotiator, is male or female in language? Versus the candidate should be a collaborative influencer, possibly a little bit more neutral in the language that you use. Right? Put a virtual $5 in a glass vase whenever you hear the word aggressive in terms of how we should be doing things faster. That's not a very good use of language, and we've heard the importance of language from a previous speaker as well. So already at the front end of your opportunity, get yourself fit for purpose, and it's easy to do. There are things to read and learn about, and there are things to explore to make sure that your um, advertisements are gender neutral, gender attractive. The other one that I wanted to highlight um, was mentoring, the importance of mentoring. Now, we're all familiar with the importance of that, but particularly um, between junior and middle level uh, um, career progression. I think there's a lot of mentoring that's dished out almost in a commodity fashion when people are onboarding, and that's the right thing to do, because people do need to settle into the, the culture of the organization, understands the do's and the don'ts. But as people are progressing through their career, as you saw on those pyramids that I saw previously, previously, there are some glass ceilings. We need to understand the boundaries. We need to help people through mentoring, through role modeling, through those glass ceilings. If your companies are not having those programs formally or informally through employee resource groups, then possibly you should be thinking about doing that because companies that are taking this subject seriously are already doing it. So um, let's talk about uh, us and what we can be doing. Let's go back to my original question. 
let's challenge ourselves how we can stop this being a subject of discussion. How Tanya in 10 to 15 or 5 years doesn't need to have it on the agenda. Unless we are doing something about it proactively with the sorts of things that I've described previously in the presentation, the chances are it'll still be there in some shape or form in 2030. All of the uh, subject matter and references I have in the presentation, so don't say you don't know where to start because here's a few examples. And you might be puzzled as to why I have orange as my background colour. It's the United Nations colour of gender equality. Thank you very much for your time. Right, so the gender gap in procurement and supply management is very concerning. The two major reports that come out every year are the ISM salary survey in the US and the SIPS Hayes salary survey in the UK. And it really isn't good news. ISM's data reveals that women are paid less than men across every level in US supply management, with male CPOs earning 26% more than female counterparts, male vice presidents earning 52% more than women, and male emerging professionals earning 13% more than women. In the UK, SIPS reports that the most striking pay disparity exists at the advanced professional level, where men earn 33% more than women, a pay gap that's widened since the previous years, which was 25%. So pay disparity at the professional and managerial levels is also considerable at 14% and 11% respectively. I'll be keeping an eye out for the next instalment of these two salary surveys and we want, really want to find out if this pay gap is continuing to widen or whether having this conversation, talking about it and putting in some policies and really trying to close that pay gap will help do something about this major concern. We're passionate about promoting and celebrating women in procurement and challenging gender disparity in the profession. Here are our most popular blogs on the subject. Hold the phone, procurement pay increase, smashing average salary, investigates standard procurement salaries and the gender pay gap in procurement. Punished for parenting, the most expensive time off you'll ever take, explores the challenges working parents face when trying to juggle their careers and their families and looks at how organisations could better facilitate this. Vicky Maver analyses why women are inclined to be more apologetic and less definitive in the workplace than men in how to stop writing like a girl in the workplace. In Working Parents, Stop Hiding Your Children at Work, Tanya Siri outlines four ways to nail being a working parent. In Who Run the World, Women in Procurement, we take a look at the gender disparity in the procurement profession. And I'm now on the hot seat with John Everett. John, good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, if you would pick one mm -hmm. thing for people to take away from your presentation today, what would that one thing be? Yeah, the one thing I would choose uh, would be a call to action uh, for the organisations, the CPOs, the leadership team of purchasing organisations, that if some of the things that you heard in my presentation aren't already being done by your organisation, um, and I gave some practice from multiple different organisations, including our own uh, in Dow, if there's some stuff that you're not doing, that's in there, then please start. It's a call to action to, to get on with this. Uh, you know, closing the gender gap won't happen by itself. We've got to be proactively involved. Now, a balance mm. that everybody mm. wants to get yes. right is that work-life balance. Yes. How can we do it correctly? Well, um, it's something that you've got to be working on all the time. And it's a cliche because people often describe it as the non-work part, the need to kind of healthy body, healthy mind is the cliche and when you associate healthy body you think about a workout of some shape or form. That isn't everybody's cup of tea. Um, there's uh, different ways to, to balance uh, work and life. Uh, sport and, uh, is one of them, physical activity, going for a walk, uh, hobbies, friends, family etc. all part of that rich mosaic. If that is out of balance there is a high probability that the over uh, component in that balance is going to dry up, it's going to become stagnant, it's going to become mundane, and it's not going to become interesting. You need some fuel always mm -hmm. for both sides of the equation. If you're happy with your work, chances are you're also going to be happy at home. 
if you're happy at home, you're also going to be happy and delivering peak performance at work. Good advice. Keep working on it, hey? Absolutely, yes. It's a continuous process. John, thank you. Welcome. We've just talked about trust. So who do people turn to? Who do they trust most for career advice in procurement? Um, most uh, of our survey responders said that uh, they go to their mentors for advice. About 30% of them actually said that. 50% uh, said they mm, go to their peers for advice. But uh, the third biggest group was people look for um, uh, their social networking platform uh, for advice about uh, their career. A uh, very easy one. Uh, to leave my big company experience and uh, start out something uh, uh, on a much smaller scale uh, on this entrepreneurial path. Very, very uh, important step for me. The hardest decision is the recent one, stopping with the company because I reached my career summit, I think, in this company. Because based on my profile, what I found, my way of working, I like new challenges. So after eight years working hard on building, elevating a full department uh, to the highest level, then without any challenge, there is no life for me. So I had to quit to go and embrace something new. I was 20 years with Roche. I had a perfect career. It was absolutely super. And I had to decide whether I take uh, a swallow the red pill or the blue pill. And I swallowed the red pill to take an opportunity outside of Roche. It was the best decision I, I, I could have made, but it was a very difficult one, yeah. I think the hardest decision was after nine years of being at Kingfisher that I chose to leave the company. I uh, put everything into that company, everything into that role, developed the function from zero, but the time was right for me to move on. Um, balancing the growth and the bottom line. Um, at times you want to keep them in harmony, but at times there's also organisational requirements to work more on the bottom line and less on the top line. So when you're having to prioritize projects, that's painful, especially some of those projects are your own children. Um, I would say probably it's the, it's the choice of um, not always being able to keep people on a team that you would like to keep on your team. So sometimes you have to make tough choices as a leader, and, and those can be very tough at times. I always wanted to go back to New York City after I've done a project there, and the decision not to go there, that was tough, but it's done. <laughs> I've never had a hard decision. I honestly have never had a hard decision. I always felt, I think the one that people consider hard is when you fire whole loads of people, right? Redundancy, et cetera, et cetera, or close companies down. I never, it was for me never a judgment on whether they're good or bad. It's just I say, here are the barriers. We have to jump over them. If you can't, it's not suitable for you. So I always felt it wasn't, uh, it was a non uh, a judgmental decision. I was a category manager for a period of time supporting our logistics organization and I kind of fell into it and I just loved it, right? I loved it because it was global in nature. I was traveling the world, able to deliver a lot of value to the organization. I was touching various different parts of the company I was working for, which was a big global manufacturing organization. And I loved it so much that I actually spent about seven years in that one category until I was appointed a mentor. And she asked me the question, she said, Did you, do you still want to be doing that role in 10 years' time? Of course, the answer to that was no. And so uh, I then moved on to uh, a different role in the company. Mm, firing people. <laughs> Never easy to you know, show up one day and say to someone, hey, you have to think about what you are doing within three months because you will not be doing it here. Thank you.